going to expand and go a little bit further than the Amen Aria series that I did a few months ago. There was part one, part two, and part three that you can also find on the YouTube channel. And today we're going to be talking about hypothalamic amenorrhea versus PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And we're going to be talking about kind of signs and symptoms and how to distinguish the two and how you can advocate for yourself as a patient when you go see your doctor um, to make sure you're getting the correct diagnosis. And I don't ever want to knock other healthcare providers. People know a lot, and I am very young, and I do not know anything. And or I don't know at all, at all. I shouldn't say anything. I should give myself a bit more credit than that. But there's a lot to learn. I just think that as a, a healthcare profession, whether that's doctors or nurse practitioners or physicians assistants or nurses or dietitians, um, we are just not well educated on this topic. I didn't really get any of this education um, during my nursing career about kind of the history, like patient presentation and what might differentiate the, differentiate the two. And then some lab testing you would want to get done or to ask your doctor about and then we'll kind of wrap up and um, summarize it all so first things first whenever we talk about hypothalamic amenorrhea I always summarize it like this for clients and also for patients um, I work in emergency medicine right now as a nurse practitioner so I don't see a lot of women's health where I sit down and talk to them about their hormonal issues but um, hopefully one day my life will transition that way. I am just not choosing not to specialize in that way with my full-time job as a nurse practitioner right now. But with Nutshell Nutrition, I talk about this a lot with clients. And so there's kind of four key things, and those four things are either having a low body fat or recently lowered weight. So let's say you've had some extreme weight loss or you've got low body fat right now, BMI, and we'll talk about how BMI isn't a clear indicator of a healthy weight. Um, a little bit in this video, but then I'll expand maybe in, an, in another video. If you have insufficient energy coming in, aka you're restricting your food intake or maybe even um, unconsciously restricting your food intake, so you have insufficient calories coming in. Um, if you have inappropriate exercise, and I say inappropriate exercise because everyone is going to have a different threshold as to what is appropriate and what is not for their body. Some women can run marathons and menstruate healthily, and some women can do yoga or walk and menstruate healthily. And so it's going to differ from woman to woman to woman, and it will also differ based on where these other factors are at, where your eating is, where your sleep is, where the stress in your life is at. So movement is one. Um, we talked about movement. We talked about body fat, insufficient calories coming in, and then also any sort of acute or chronic stress. So that could be acute as in last night's sleep was really poor. And then it becomes a chronic issue, right? So you're getting lack of sleep all the time. It could be that you went through a divorce. It could be that it could be good stressors. Um, like I just got out of wedding planning or um, it's you got just start a new job and you have tons of stress there. And perhaps maybe that is contributing. Sorry, maybe that is contributing to lack of sleep and those sorts of things. So really those four categories, stress, um, your body weight and where it's at now which those determining factors are largely influenced by energy intake and energy output in the form of movement or exercise. So those are kind of those four main categories that can contribute to amenorrhea. So now amenorrhea comes with PCOS and also comes with hypothalamic amenorrhea. So that's what we're going to get into a little bit today. So typically when you go see your doctor, they start with a verbal history, um, then they'll do a physical exam on you, and then they'll maybe order some labs, like some blood work, um, and maybe some also some diagnostic testing. Like in this case, since we're talking about amenorrhea and PCOS, that might be a pelvic ultrasound or a transvaginal ultrasound, some sort of imaging. And so typically um, that happens and then your doctor makes a diagnosis. Well, where the confusion I think happens sometimes is that oftentimes, more times than not, PCOS, that diagnosis is made based on the absence of a period, so amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea, ugh, that's always a mouthful, where you're having longer than normal periods because PCOS can um, cause you to have really long periods, irregular, sporadic, um, and then you see you have these polycystic ovaries, right? And so there's cysts that are seen on ultrasound. Now there has to be a certain number of cysts that are seen in order to diagnose that as PCOS. Um, polycystic ovaries I think it's like more than 25 um, or more than like 10 milliliters of volume um, 
so don't quote me on that because I'm not sure. That's why we I can only fit so many numbers in my brain. But it has to you have to see polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. Now, oftentimes that's how you know a woman has those two characteristics, and we diagnose based on that. One, because I think polycystic ovarian syndrome is way, way, way more um, well-known in the medical field. It's more of a common diagnosis. And two, um, we're just, those two criteria are just more quicker to be diagnosed than you would see a diagnosis for HA. And so those two overlapping criteria are what usually get mixed up. Now there's a third one, which is this hyperandrogenism, where women have an excess amount of androgens flowing around in their blood. Your, two, your most common one you're going to think of is something like testosterone, or DHEAS is another common one. There's a few others too, but I don't need to name off every single one for you guys. Um, I can put them in the notes at the end of this um, video. So those three criteria, really the, like, the trifecta that come together to make it so you are more confident in your diagnosis of PCOS, along with some physical symptoms, which we're going to talk about in just a second. So you have the hyperandrogenism, you also have polycystic, polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, and you also have the absence of a period or really long periods. So those three things together. Now, in addition to that, with hypothalamic amenorrhea, you're not going to have that hyperandrogenism, actually. So and just to backstep a little bit, Androgens are not only exclusive male sex hormones. Both women and men have them. Men just have them in a higher amount than women. And particularly in women, androgens are responsible for being converted to estrogens, which we obviously need. And those are more abundant in women than they are in men. So let's go into a little bit um, into what is the difference. So let's say you go in, your doctor draws labs for you, and they come back. What what differentiates HA versus PCOS. And so I think this is really key, especially not only as healthcare providers that we're actually drawing the labs and interpreting them, but you as a patient can become more um, educated and therefore able to advocate for yourself. I've been in your shoes, I have had hypothalamic amenorrhea, and I have been very, very frustrated by the healthcare system. So my hope is that this can empower you um, to know a little bit more about what might be going on. So typically they'll draw a female hormone panel, they'll draw you know a ton of androgen labs, um, they'll probably draw a thyroid panel, perhaps a few other things, but those are kind of the typical blood work pieces that you'll get back. And so what's the difference between all of those is that you have your LH, your FSH, and your estradiol, and those are some main female hormones that really play a huge role in your reproductive cycle. So typically with HA, you're going to have a low to normal LH, luteinizing hormone. Typically, it's actually a little bit low. Um, and there's some different ranges that you'll see depending on if you're, um, you know, menopausal, premenopausal, those sorts of things. But your doctor can help you um, interpret those. But typically, your LH is going to be low to normal in hypothalamic amenorrhea. Now, in PCOS, LH is actually going to be at least normal, or it could be two to three times as high as FSH, which is your follicle-stimulating hormone. Stay with me, and I'm hoping I'm explaining this clearly. In addition to that, estradiol, or E2 as you see it, is usually low in HA, meaning you have low amounts of estrogen. And then it's typically normal to high in somebody with PCOS. Um, lastly, you're going to see those androgen levels like I just talked about, um, where we really want to be taking a look at especially free testosterone. But typically those androgen levels are going to be normal in women with HA and they're going to be elevated in PCOS. So those are really important. Those, are, those aren't all the labs, but those are some big ones that can help differentiate between HA and then between PCOS. Now let's talk a little bit about physical symptoms too, where this is where it's super important for your doctor to ask you questions, to be asking about your history, to be taking a look, to be doing the physical exam, all those things that are so important. So with PCOS, um, some of those typical physical symptoms you're going to see are hirsutism. Her hirsutism. I think that right. I always mess up that word. But what it basically means is it means um, some facial hair growth. So you might have some upper hair, um, some upper hair, some um, hair on your upper lip, perhaps around your jawline. Really, it's just excess hair growth in women, and that's due to those higher levels of, of androgens, which then make you make women have more of those male features. Um, so obviously men have more facial hair and those sorts of things. You can also have um, scalp 
like hair thinning on the scalp area. You can also have, um, so we talked about the facial hair, we talked about the hair on the scalp thinning. So overabundance here, thin here, which then obviously makes it really, really hard for somebody um, going through this. Typically you have more acne from the higher level of androgens. And then you're also gonna have something called acanthosis nigricans. And that's um, like kind of like this velvety texture around the neck and your skin, like dark pigmentation. And that's actually from the insulin resistance um, that PCOS can cause. And that's kind of a whole nother conversation. But I have another video on my YouTube channel about treating PCOS, so you can definitely go check that out um, after you watch this one. Now with HA, you're gonna have, there, typically people with HA are thinner body weight or not even thinner. Women with a normal BMI can have HA. Even women with a higher BMI. BMI doesn't even matter that much. Um, because even when with a higher BMI, let's say they've had some drastic weight loss, that could cause and induce um, some hypothalamic amenorrhea. But typically, um, you're not, you're going to see, you're not going to have as thin of a woman have PCOS. You can have PCOS if you are normal BMI. This is not an overweight condition, which is what we typically, um, and women are kind of typically seeing your, you know, typical patient that gets diagnosed with PCOS or as healthcare providers, we're ignorant. We want to jump to that conclusion when we see a woman with a higher BMI and that's not okay either. Um, but they, you know, you might have, you have to look a little bit more in the history. What are their eating habits? Do they have a low body fat? Um, have they been over under a lot of stress? Do, do they exercise intensely? Have they just started running a marathon? Have exercise habits changed? Has weight fluctuated drastically in either direction? All of those things are going to be really important. So you have some more physical symptoms of PCOS and in HA, yeah, you have some physical symptoms like a lower body weight and things like that, but you're really going to have to dig into that history. And what are the lifestyle habits around that? I can't tell you the amount of times that I didn't get asked those questions. Um, when I was actually had, um, I ran, when I was actually had, um, I ran a lot and I think I was eating enough, but maybe not enough. And so that's really when a dietitian can play a really integral role as she partners with a physician or he partners with a physician and tries to get down to the nitty gritty of nutrition and those other lifestyle factors. So you have your history. You have the physical exam, which that we're going to see those PCOS, more physical symptoms, hair thinning, hair growth here, acne, um, the acanthosis nigricans. History is going to be super important when both PCOS and in hypothalamic amenorrhea. You're going to draw your labs, and they're going to order some diagnostic testing with the, with the pelvic ultrasound. And based on all of that, that entire picture, then we can say, yes, this woman has PCOS, or yes, this woman has HA. And, um, but often... Healthcare works against us with insurance, and at the end of the day, healthcare is a business, and so maybe there's not enough time to do all that, or maybe um, maybe perhaps you do need to find a different position. Maybe that's not their bread and butter to look at that. Um, but I think all of that and paying attention to all of that really is some, all the things you need to take into consideration in order to make sure you're getting the correct diagnosis. Now, one thing I do want to add near the end is that you can have hypothalamic or amenorrhea and PCOS at the same time because PCOS is not a hypothalamic-derived um diagnosis and so those two can happen at the same time it's just that usually the HA dominates and you the clinical picture will look more um, in line with hypothalamic amenorrhea than um, PCOS but once you start to take care of the hypothalamic amenorrhea you might see the clinical picture more, look more like PCOS um, it's not usually the case but I don't want to say it, it can happen and also another thing um, just everything that I just said we are talking about in the circumstances that other reasons for all of these symptoms of HA and all these symptoms of PCOS have been excluded. So we are excluding any other differential diagnosis um, that could be a possibility before we say, okay, now we're doing hypothalamic amenorrhea versus PCOS. So that's important. So I just know that sometimes I can't speak to everything and I'm literally focusing in on these two things with the assumption that other things have been taken off of the drawing board. So I hope that's helpful for you guys. Um, please email me uh, with follow-up questions that you have. My hope is that I can help um, people and women 
um, and anyone concerned with this, this is mainly obviously a woman's issue, better help navigate um, their health and better be able to communicate with their doctor to get the best care that they possibly need. So I should say their doctor or their MP or their PA. So I hope that's helpful for you guys. Have an awesome week. Um, and email me with follow-up questions, and there will be probably a part two to this video. All right. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you.